Did you know that it's actually legal if a team scores a bucket with six players on the court, and the ref does not notice? You can legit score a basket and get away with it, which we've seen happen on numerous occasions. Do you also know what happens if at least five members on a single team dies? What do they do next? In this video, we're gonna take a look at some of the NBA's strangest but most intriguing rules. This'll be fun. How's it going folks, my name's Andy, and without further ado, let's begin. Six players on the court. If you've watched the NBA for a long time, you probably occasionally have seen a team put out six players at a time, whether it's by accident or on purpose. What's even funnier is that they usually get away with it. We've seen it multiple times in the past where a team actually scores a field goal while having six players on the floor, yet it still counts. They don't even review it or take away the points. The reason for this is because there's no rule prohibiting you from doing this as long as the refs do not notice it. The official rule states that if a team has more than 5 players on the court when the ball is in play, a technical foul will be assessed to that team. However, just like all violations or fouls, the refs have to realize it's happening first before they call it. In cases where a team tries to sneak in a player and nobody sees it, they can get away with it. Heck, we've seen this happen even in the most critical moments. The 2014 playoffs at the end of Game 6 between the Spurs and Mavs. The Spurs had 6 players on the court for a while, with 0.4 seconds left in the game. They needed a bucket to tie the game. If it wasn't for Monte Ellis screaming at the refs, they wouldn't even have noticed. Damn, Pop, that's some next level play. Just imagine if nobody noticed it and the Spurs tied the game with 6 players on the court. That would have been hilarious, but it might have also led to a change in the rulebook. Like if a team scores with more than 5 players, then the basket would not count. Honestly, that's what the rule should be. To add on to that, this rule is also similar for other interferences on the court. For example, recently you might have seen the OKC Mop Boys get in the way of a Timberwolves fast break. Yet, the refs didn't even call anything, they just let the play keep going. Now, this is kinda tough to call because if the refs stopped the game to tell the Mop Boys to get off the court, then the Timberwolves would have missed out on a fast break opportunity. But since they didn't call anything, the Mop Boys ruined the fast break anyway. The refs usually swallow their whistles and let it go in situations like this. It's just seen as an accident, there's no malice involved, so they let the play continue. You must call timeouts. Have you realized that timeouts are actually mandatory? If a team refuses to use their timeouts, they force them to do so anyway. Here's the official rule on this. There must be two mandatory timeouts in each period, or quarter. If neither team has taken a timeout prior to 6.59 of the period, it shall be mandatory for the official scorer to take it at the first dead ball, and charge it to the home team. That does seem a bit unfair, doesn't it? If the home team doesn't need a timeout, then why force them to take one? Well, it's because they gotta play commercials. The NBA's gotta make money and contractually, they need to play a certain number of ads throughout the course of the game. Still, it kinda hurts the purity of basketball. Timeouts are supposed to be strategic and calculated, not a tool for generating revenue. If neither team wants a timeout, then let them keep playing. All those official commercial break timeouts, they ruin the flow of the game. I understand it though, it's necessary. Each team gets 7 timeouts throughout regulation, with 4 maximum in the 4th quarter. Imagine if the mandatory timeout rule did not exist, and the 4 max timeouts in the 4th quarter did not exist either, and you're free to use timeouts whenever you want to. I bet some teams would just purposely stack all 7 timeouts until the last few minutes of a game, then we'd have the most sluggish end of game situations ever. Heck, the 4th quarter might last an hour by itself. Commercial after commercial, timeout after timeout, I mean, even now, it already feels like that. Cause the refs take such a long time to review plays at the end of games. So, I guess this rule does make sense. Can you punch the ball? We don't see it often, but sometimes, we do see players punch the ball, or hit it with their fist, whether it's a pass or a kick out or something else. For example, in this play here, the truth is, this is illegal. Well, at least it should be, but the refs did not call it. 
The rulebook states, A player shall not kick the ball or strike it with the fist. Kicking the ball or striking it with the fist is a violation when it is an intentional act. The ball accidentally striking the foot, the leg, or fist is not a violation. Here, Lonzo Ball intentionally hit the ball with his fist in order to pass it ahead to Alex Caruso. It wasn't an accident, obviously, so it should be a violation. The rule further states, If the violation is by the offense, the ball is awarded to the opposing team on the sideline nearest the spot of the violation. So this should have been a turnover by the rulebook. Of course, the refs let it slide because <laughs> this pass was pretty slick. Either that or they didn't realize he punched the ball. However, the rule is far more interesting when it comes to kickballs. I feel like there are many times when players extend their leg to kick the ball on purpose, to stop a pass. Yet, the refs don't call it all the time, because they assume it's unintentional. Of course, many times, players do accidentally kick it, especially when they're chasing a loose ball, like this play here. Overall, there's a lot of inconsistency in how it's called. Sometimes, intentional kicks don't seem intentional, and accidental kicks get called as violations. I've probably seen more players get technicals and ejections from kicking the ball during a dead play. Like these right here, which is kind of funny. Fouled out, but still in the game. What happens when an NBA player fouls out, but there's no other players available to play? Well, the player who fouls out can remain on the floor, but the thing is, every additional foul he commits results in an additional technical free throw. This has happened more in the NBA's early days, but over the decades, you still see it happen now and then. For example, in a game at the end of the season between the Warriors and Blazers back in 2010, the Warriors basically only had five players available. They listed eight of them as being active, but three of them were injured. It was the final game of the season, so they were just like, whatever. The thing is, one of those guys, Devin George, fouled out, but this situation was kinda weird because they technically had three other active players. Don Nelson tried to argue that they couldn't play and they should just let George stay on the floor, which is what the rule states. After some discussion, the refs let George return to the court. Another more prominent example involved the Lakers during that miserable stretch of years. In a mid-season regular season game in 2014, the Lakers were decimated with injuries. In a game against the Cavs, both Jordan Farmar and Nick Young suffered injuries during that game. Chris Kamen fouled out already. Then, with three minutes left in the game, Robert Sacre also fouled out. But because the Lakers had no available players left, he was allowed to stay in the game, and each foul he further committed would result in an additional technical free throw. Now, Chris Kamen could have also returned to the game as well since he fouled out earlier, but he wasn't exactly in the mood for it, so the Lakers sent Sacre back in. Overall, this rule coming into play is very rare. A team has to be riddled with injuries for something like this to happen. The Disaster Draft This is a situation that's by far the least likely to happen, but it's always an interesting what-if scenario. So, what is the disaster draft? Well, it occurs when five or more players on a single team are either killed or disabled. If that were to happen, the NBA would announce an emergency disaster draft. In this draft, every other team in the league could only protect five players on their own team. Every unprotected player can be taken by the team that suffered those casualties. This protection is a lot less compared to an expansion draft, where teams can protect up to eight players. So, a disaster draft could be a huge game changer. A team's 6th or 7th or 8th man could be lost. And if your team is deep, it could have a devastating impact on your championship hopes. For example, let's say 5 of the Sacramento Kings players died. And a disaster draft was announced. Now every other team is scrambling. The Bucks' current roster looks like this. Assuming they protect Giannis, Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, and Bobby Portis, they only have one other protection left. They'd have to give up either Grayson Allen or Pat Connaughton or maybe even Brooke Lopez or George Hill. The Clippers would be devastated. They'll probably protect Kawhi, PG, maybe Luke Kennard and Zubats, because they're young. That's four. The fifth guy would have to be decided between Reggie Jackson, Marcus Morris, Norman Powell, Nicholas Batum, Terrence Mann, and Isaiah Hartenstein. That's a lot of talent that could be snatched away. Now, I'm having some dark thoughts. 
What if some random team decides to kill their own five worst players? Damn, I don't know what the consequences would be, but they'll have a nice upgrade to their roster. Anyway, that's all folks. Those were some weird but interesting rules that you probably did not know about. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section which other rules I should have talked about. Which other rules do you know about that are worth talking about? Thank you all so much for watching, I hope y'all enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.